Hi, have you ever heard of the Hearn Hut Revival? Well, today you're in for a treat because that's exactly what this episode is about. Learn how a painting inspired a young man to uh, branch out and to be used of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he was filled with the Holy Spirit simply by viewing a painting in an art gallery. You gotta hear this story. Hi and welcome back and thank you for joining me again. Thank you for liking and subscribing. To date, we have 365 subscribers. I noticed that there was a couple more subscribers. Just like to say thank you and uh, a shout out to all of you who are watching. I noticed that the last episode got a few more uh, views. I would encourage you if you're just tuning in to look back at some of the other videos. They might encourage you. You may not like all of them. But I would encourage you just to stick with me and be patient in the Lord. I am a born-again man, and I, I'm not interested in unsound doctrine or teaching. I fear the Lord greatly, and I just want to encourage the saints. So hopefully, with that being said, uh, you understand that that according to that psalm that, I ju that you just read, uh, it says that we are to declare the ways of old, the things that God has done. Our mouth is to rejoice in all that he has done. And these stories tell specific events sometimes. Uh, sometimes they're personal. I just want to, like I said, encourage the saints, encourage you out there uh, to strive to be... Uh, to grow in the grace and knowledge of him, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Anyway, um, this is a an episode that's that's uh, very meaningful to me in that uh, it's probably one of the greatest revivals that few people talk about. As in, uh, you know, we wouldn't have heard of of uh, John Wesley and some of these guys if it wasn't for the Moravians. And so this is really an origin story of the. Uh, Moravians, uh, but it goes back further than the uh, revival I'm going to tell you about. In fact, they call it the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like in the book of Acts, how the Holy Spirit came upon them, and there was uh, there was all kinds of miraculous things happening around this event, and these were the most reserved type of people you can imagine, but I don't want to spoil anything for you. In order for you to understand the origin of the origin story, we have to go back, way back, into the late 1300s to a fellow named John Wycliffe. And many of you have heard of him. We have the Wycliffe Society today. Uh, this was the origin of the origin. In fact, uh, many people uh, attribute him to being the origin person of the Great Reformation, which of course we think that it really only started in the 1600s. It goes back further than that. It was really John Wycliffe's writing that started it all. It was a snowball effect. In fact, Oxford goes back that far. And John Wycliffe was attending Oxford and uh, he began writing. Now that at that time, the Roman Catholic Church had pretty much all the control. All the power belonged to them. In fact, they didn't even give the glory to God. They were, they were, they were buying people. They were having people buy their way into heaven. And, and, uh, and John Wycliffe was appalled. It was an abomination. And he wasn't the only one. But he was the first one to really start to denounce this way of thinking. Started to denounce the Roman Catholic Church and their practices and their idolatry and their wicked ways. And so he was really, uh, really the trendsetter or the, the forerunner uh, to the great um, uh, Reformation that we read about today. Uh, he had some writings when he was in Oxford and they became quite popular, so popular that the leadership 
uh, put a ban on all writings of anybody who has any what they called private interpretation of scripture. In other words, they felt what that meant was that only the bishops, only the fathers, only the Roman Catholic leaders could give direction. And these men were not even born again. They were giving the direction, many of them reprobate uh, abusers, and they were giving the direction of the entire church and uh, the, the body of Christ at that point was so corrupt, it wasn't even the body of Christ anymore. There, but there was a few uh, believers who stepped out. John Wycliffe, the most brave of them all, the righteous are as bold as lions. This man was a lion for the gospel. And in fact, so much so that they booted him out of Oxford and he was dejected and ashamed for a season. But his writings fell into the hands. Later on, there was uh, the, what they called the Lawlers. They were followers of, uh, well, not followers, but, but they, they were people that, that were devoted um, worshipers of God. They were good, godly, Christian, prayerful people, and they appreciated the writings of Wycliffe. And uh, then there was a man in uh, Bohemia who got a hold of that. And that man's name was John Huss. Now, John Huss was a holiness preacher, a man filled with the Spirit of God. He had also this uh, experience with the Holy Spirit that filled him to the brim. When this man spoke, reports of fear and trembling came over people, and uh, they came to salvation and repentance and were immediately baptized in many occasions. Uh, but when he preached... He preached the holiness of God, and he got a hold of Wycliffe's writings. And isn't it interesting that Wycliffe also was this great prayer engine? And uh, so uh, one of the things that, uh, that John Huss preached, actually he preached three things, three main things in a Christian life. And that was a deep prayer life and the study of the Word of God and, and holiness living. He, he stressed the, the importance of to live holy that you might be most effective in the, in the hands of the Holy Spirit to change the world. And uh, these men and women were called the Hussites. And uh, if you skip th forward 300 years from that time that John Huss was martyred, by the way, he was martyred and burned at the stake. He died a tragic death and uh, while he died, he gave glory to God. And uh, what an amazing man of God this guy was. Like, like Stephen, he just had his eyes on heaven. And I'm sure like with Stephen, Jesus stood when this man was crucified or, or was burned at the stake. And so jump forward 300 years, uh, the Moravians had had already formed, but they weren't fully formed. They weren't fully developed until they met this guy, Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. But to save myself further injury of my larynx, I don't think I'm going to try to pronounce that full name ever again. Anyway, I think I'm going to call him from this point on, as they referred to him then, Brother Ludwig or Count Zinzendorf. Um, but he was a, a uh, Lutheran pastor, and he was known, I, I think there was some kind of turmoil, I really haven't, I don't, I don't know why, uh, from Bohemia, uh, on the border of Moravia, Moravia they, they decided to make this long, arduous trek, some of the, the, the um, Hussites uh, uh, made this long trek, because they heard that that Zinzendorf was, uh, was, was taking in refugees at the time. For some reason, something was going on politically, and uh, they were pretty much, the Moravians were fleeing uh, persecution. Uh, some of them, just by the sheer moving of the Holy Spirit, decided that they needed to push on and uh, go into this other part of Germany uh, where, where they encountered... Uh, um, Ludwig. Now, Ludwig housed them, gave them shelter, and uh, had some strict demands on the society which they later formed and called it the Moravian Mission Society or the Moravian Society. 
uh, or the Hearn Hut Brethren, uh, but whatever you want to call it, there was an event that happened that today is one of the uh, most clear uh, realities that the day of Pentecost didn't only happen in the book of Acts, but it happened again at Hernhut on these, uh, many of them were basically lay people. And uh, there, in fact, one of the, the fellows that was nursed back to health that came with the Moravians and met Zinzendorf was a man named Christian David. And you could read about his exploits in Christ yourself. But in fact, I, I think I'll probably do a video on him at some point because uh, 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 this man had accomplished so much for the kingdom of God. From this event, he really uh, wasn't a gifted like a lot of these people. A lot of ministers were born in 1727. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon a congregation, God gifted them immediately, powerfully, wonderfully in a moment. Uh, they were changed forever and they had no desire for worldly things at all. And, uh, and so they went out and formed all kinds of societies and mission groups that have deeply impacted us today. In fact, we will hear names of certain mission groups that, that can be tracked back to this moment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, uh, as they call it, another Pentecost. And in fact, they coined the phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this moment because they didn't know what else name to give it. But they knew that that God and uh, David Christensen and uh, some of the other witnesses in their own writings wrote it was the most powerful event of their lives. It was the nearness of God and the fear of the Lord washed over people. And there were miracles and many things uh, that were coming out of this, the speaking in tongues and, and all kinds of stuff was going on in the moment that this happened because God was so uh, uh, favorable to them. In fact, believe it or not, um, it, it, a hundred year prayer meeting began because of that event at Hernhut. A hundred year prayer meeting where they prayed, where each took turns for one hour a day, they committed before each other uh, to pray one hour a day, 24 hours a day for 100 years, folks. Uh, can you imagine if we had that kind of heart? And isn't that the kind of heart that Christ expects us to have? But we have no interest. We are too worldly and, uh, and, and, it's, it's, and f to some degree, many of, of the Moravians were uh, before that, before that event in 1722. Um, but before I close, I I want to say that uh, that would never have happened that event if God hadn't called Ludwig uh, Zinzendorf into ministry. And the way he called them into ministry blows my mind. Uh, he was at an art gallery, and he was a member. This guy at 14 years old was dedicated to prayer. Um, he, he would pray an hour in the morning and an hour, at, an hour at night. And he made that commitment to God and never broke it. In fact, it only increased. And that man would pray for hours and hours like Wycliffe, like uh, Huss, and uh, like Christian David. These were men given to holy sacrificial prayer. And uh, they couldn't care less about food for the most part, it's amazing how God sustained them. But you go ahead and read your, read into these men yourself. And this event is the most recordable. In fact, uh, Charles Spurgeon um, mentioned uh, in him one of his last sermons that uh, there was a time where he didn't think that the day of Pentecost would could happen again, that it was uniquely for the disciples at the start of the church, but he had changed his mind because of Hernhut. Um, and I think this is an amazing uh, testimony for one of the greats like Charles Spurgeon to confess that uh, he was convinced that the day of Pentecost was not only needed uh, at the end of his life in his in the world, but he recognized that it was essential in the Christian, in the church's development throughout the ages. Anyway, 
Uh, but going back to this event in 1719, um, uh, Zinzendorf decides to go into an art museum and uh, he sees this picture called Behold the Man. And it was a picture of Christ, as you see here. Uh, and, and on the bottom of this was written the words, I've done this for you. What have you done for me? And the moment he read those words, the Spirit of God fell on him. And, uh, and this is a moment that changed his, the course of his life and his direction and his attitude. He became a holiness preacher, a man of holiness, given to Christ to do what he wills, to, to completely die to himself. And uh, the rest is pretty much history. Now, in, in uh, 1721, just before the Hernhut incident or the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the community, um, uh, he met his wife, Dorothy, there. Uh, and it was a, a great love story. But that's for another time. Um, but this event in 1727, who knew that it could be sparked by visiting an art gallery and and looking upon a painting that somebody did unknowingly uh, would change the course of history. Really, it is amazing what God uses as catalysts to bring about these amazing events. You might be a lowly artist or a lowly little book writer or a person like myself doing a lowly little video, uh, but who knows the impact that Christ through you will use to, uh, to, to birth uh, some of the greatest movements on earth. I love to watch God orchestrate men and women you know, the, the scriptures say that uh, the steps of a good person, a good man, a good woman are ordered of the Lord. And, uh, and it, it shows itself in history, in the church history, when God is in control of man. Anyway, folks, um, I love you all. Thank you for listening. Uh, God bless you. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. This has inspired you to believe for greater things. And remember... It's okay. Uh, the real estate in Christ is, is uh, you will never be sorrow, sorry or full of sorrow that you've invested your whole everything into Christ. He will reward you, whether on earth or in heaven, uh, but he will use you somewhere along the line in the Christian experience in, that is written in heaven. Your name is there and there will be fruit attributed to you in attributing to the growth of his church and the expansion of it. Oh yeah, one more thing. I just want to make a small disclaimer. Earlier I said that there were reports of the, the, the people were speaking in tongues. That is true. However, the early Moravians and many of them did not even record these events because they didn't really support it, but it was happening. Um, some, some, and they branched out in different directions and areas, and they had, I'm sure, some sh sharp disagreements. But when the Holy Spirit uh, uh, washes over or pours out upon people, who can control him? Uh, I certainly can't, nor would I. Uh, I just praise him for the events. Anyway, thanks for listening. God bless you. See you again. Bye.